Okay, so joints, this is a pretty easy one. I think this is only like maybe 20 some slides, so not super long. Joints is a transition from skeleton going into the muscle. So there are three types of joints. There are classifications and types, and don't mistake the two. So the three types of joints you have, the first one is diarthrosis, and then amphi and the sin. When I look at these, I always remember this name in the middle, amphi. What's an amphibian? What's an example? Frogs, right, water, things that like a salamander or a frog. What is it about amphibians that make them special? Yep, they can live in the water or nobody has any other idea. In the water or they can live on land. Yeah. There we go, pen. So when you look at this amphi, it means both. It can do both. Diarthrosis is one extreme, synarthrosis is the other extreme, amphiarthrosis is in between. The diarthrosis is especially important. This is the one you're going to have to know the most about. Diarthrosis, they're extremely mobile. Like your shoulder, your hip, your elbow, where you have a lot of mobility. Diarthrosis. Synarthrosis, not mobile. So they have barely any movement at all, if any at all. So things like the sutures in the skull, when you look at those little stitch-like structures in the skull, and remember I told you that, um, I did tell you about Donald Sutherland, the osteopath that was laying on his head on the leather helmet. I thought this was this class, maybe not. Anyway, there was an osteopath that did this, these experiments, and he would lay on his head and put pressure on those spots to see if they were mobile, and he found that they would actually move a little bit. So those have barely any mobility. Die, extremely mobile. Sin, barely mobile at all. Amphi, in between. They're kind of mobile, but not extremely. So places like costo-sternal. If you had to put those words together, I know I already told you this word costo. Anybody remember what it meant? If you don't, you might want to write it down. Costal refers to your ribs. What do you think sternal refers to? The sternum, where the ribs and the sternum meet. So that way you can breathe. When you breathe, you can feel your ribs kind of move out. It's slightly movable. It's not as mobile as your elbow or your, your uh, shoulder. Intervertebral discs, where are they? And if you forgot where they were, what's the name tell you? Inter means between the vertebra discs. And we talked about these last week. These are a little bit mobile, but when you put them all together and you stack all of them on top of each other, you get a lot of extension and flexion. Huh? It's on Blackboard. Yep, it's on Blackboard, and uh, I think it says week 5, 6, or 6, 7, something like that. And then pubic symphysis, do you remember where that's at? Where's it telling you you're looking? What part of the body are you looking for? By the pubic region, so pubic bone. And the pubic symphysis was, remember, that little piece of cartilage right here between your what bones? So this is the coxal bone, and it had three regions on it. What was the region up front called? Not hard. The pubis, yeah, so the pubic bone or the pubis. What was the one on the back, the butt bone? So it was an eye. Ischium, and what about this one up here, the big wing with that crest? Ilium. Ilium, or the iliac crest, right. So don't forget those three bones. A lot of these joints tell you exactly where they're at. Some of them are layperson terms like the knee, the hip, and the elbow. All right, and then synarthrosis again, things aren't very mobile. Your teeth, are they very mobile? Can you wiggle them? If you grab a hold of them, you can wiggle them a little bit, right? So they have a little bit slight mobility, but for the most part, you don't want them wiggling around. All right, so joint classification, synovial is going to be an important one. Synovial is going to be the one we spend the most time on, the one you'll have to remember. Synovial joints fall under the one that's extremely mobile. Would that be sin, die, or amphiarthrosis? Die. Diarthrosis. So synovial joints are a subclass of diarthrosis. They're extremely mobile. One of the characteristics of a synovial joint that you want to have down somewhere is that it has a special cavity in it. It's called a synovial cavity. Tell you. Synovial joint, synovial cavity. What do you think that's full of? Fluids. Fluids. Why? So the, so the bones don't rub together and it helps with lubrication. So, mm -hmm. so all those extremely mobile joints, synarthrosis. And here are the important structures. There's actually in your in your lab manual, not your lab notebook, but your lab manual, there's a blank picture of this. You should probably put a star by it. But when you look, here you have the bone up at the top, and there's your periosteum, which is telling you it's going around the outside edge of the bone. Um, 
I lost my pen and stuff. It, back in the back in the review sheet, there is one in the lab manual in the be towards the beginning of it that's filled out, but there's also a blank one at the back in the review sheet. I lost my <laughs> pen somehow. <coughs> All right, now it's froze. All right, well, anyway, so here's your periosteum that comes along here. And periosteum means around the bone, remember? So it's going around the bone. And then that periosteum forms a ligament. A ligament and a tendon are different. A tendon connects a muscle to a bone. Where do you think a ligament joins? Look at the picture. Where's it starting in? Bone to bone. So here you have a ligament that comes all the way up over. My pen's not working again. Might have a problem. Nothing is responding. Okay, hopefully that just picked right up. So the different parts you have the periosteum that runs along here, still not working. Son of a Okay, well, I just lost the pen, but we can still keep going. So along the edge out here, you have the periosteum, which is my finger to point. It's around the bone. The ligament, you can see, is part of the periosteum that just merges right in. This is connective tissue. The ligament comes up over the joint and then connects to another bone. Ligaments connect bone to bone. Tendons connect muscle to bone. Just underneath that, you have this outer capsule, and it's really fibrous to protect and hold things together. So the ligament's holding and supporting the bone. The fibrous capsule is actually giving support to the joint itself. And then just underneath that, you can see that inner layer, and they call that the synovial membrane. But look where it's at. Nothing really breaks. Everything's continuous in your body. So if you look at the synovial membrane, it comes along, it comes out to the end of the bone, it forms a cartilage. Do you remember that cartilage I told you it was? Articular. Articular for a joint. And do you remember what type, since it looks like glass? Hyaline. <laughs> so hyaline cartilage. As you get older, that stuff wears off. If you don't take care of yourself, it starts wearing off faster and faster and causes what? <coughs> What do you think? It's a joint. As it's wearing down, it causes arthritis. Yeah. That type's actually called osteoarthritis. There's more than one, but that's a specific one. So connect collectively, you have the articular capsule, which is the fibrous capsule in the synovial membrane. They form the walls of that cavity. And then the fluid inside is just synovial fluid. All right, fibrous joints. So the fibrous joints are fibers that are connecting things together. They're not solid. They're like connect, well, they are connective tissue. We talked about this when we talked about the joint that connects the tibia with the fibula. What was the name of that joint? If you had to pull it out of your ass, what would you say it was? <laughs> it's the tibio fibular joint. Yep. So don't overthink things. Most of the joints, if they're not common sense, like when you're a kid learning the elbow and the knee and all of those layperson terms, your parents didn't teach you the tibio fibular joints. But those ones that they didn't teach you typically tell you where they're at. Like when we were talking about costal sternal, where's it telling you? If you saw that name on a test, where would you look for on the body for that? Costal sternal. Yeah. The, ribs. the ribs and the sternum, where they come together. If you're looking for something that's intervertebral, where's the first place you're going to look for? The vertebra and then between the vertebra. So if you ever forget the name, guess. Make an educated guess. So where do you think the radio ulnar joint's at? between the radius and the ulna. Yep. So yeah, it can be right here at the wrist where they connect, and that's the what? Proximal or distal one? Distal. Distal, and then the proximal one's up here by the elbow. Okay. Another key, no joint cavity. That was the synovial joints. These are a connective tissue. They're just fibrous. They're helping support things or hold them together. And you can see that's a ligament connecting the two. And then the last one, cartilaginous joints. They're made of cartilage. And the cartilaginous joints, the perfect one to remember is that one I just pointed out a couple times. It's written in green, the pubic symphysis. Just guessing where that would be, where would it be? Pubic symphysis. Pubic region. Yep, it's the joint right in between the two pubic bones. And then intervertebral discs are another example. Don't mix up the types and the classifications because you can actually, if you look at classifications, intervertebral discs are a type of cartilaginous joint but what did that fall under? Did that fall under sin, die, or anterior arthrosis? Was it extremely mobile? 
is this one intervertebral disc, scream and mobile? So it's not die, but is it fused together? So it's not sin. It's kind of in between, so it would be amphi. It's cartilaginous, but amphi. But then when you look at the pubic symphesis, the pubic symphesis is very fixed. It doesn't move barely at all. What would that be? That would be sino or sino. Not synovial, right? So synarthrosis. And then your elbow is where you have anywhere you can pop, basically. You ever twisted your back and you heard it pop? Mm -hmm. Your joints in your fingers that you can pop? You ever popped your knee? Yeah. Any of those joints that you can pop, they're all synovial joints. They're extremely mobile. They have that little pocket of fluid. When you pop it, you shift that fluid and it makes that snappy sound. And no, you're not going to get arthritis because it's snappy joints. Some people actually say it's better for you because it's actually moving the fluid around. It doesn't give you arthritis, no matter what your mom or grandmother say. Was oh, it your mom or your grandmother? Yeah, Hell yeah, they always tell you that's what the, why they call them wives' tales, right? Get all the not husbands' tales because we don't lie. We just don't lie. <laughs> You're lying right there. <laughs> okay, so anyway, joints, they're designed for their function. Here you see the sutures again. And if you remember, what's that suture that goes straight up the middle of the soul? What plane does it fit in? Third the number the two suture. That you left to right, so it's a sagittal, sagittal suture. What do you call this one back here that connects the occipital lobe? Start with an L. Does it help? L for what? L. L. I don't even know how to make the sound, but yay. So, land story. Uh, and then, uh, we don't actually, what was this flat one that squashed in between the parietal and temporal? Squamous, squamous, yep. And of course, these are designed so that when you're a baby, your head can squeeze and move around and get through. Do you remember the F word that was the name for the sutures when they're a baby? Fontanelles. Fontanelles, yeah. It's like the uh, cotton, cottony toilet paper stuff, cottonelle, but it's fontanelle. Okay, and then the symphesis again, they're just where you have these joints that have a little bit of mobility, but not very much at all. When would you want this to be mobile, this pubic symphesis? Right, when you're squeezing a Volkswagen out of your vagina. <laughs> isn't that right? It's like squeezing a watermelon out of a hole the size of a grape. I mean, it's pretty accurate, isn't it? I am so glad I'm not a woman. Right, not every female is grape size, so. Whatever. <laughs> now who's saying, wow? Okay, and then we already walked through this, so definitely know the different parts of a synovial joint. Like, what was the name of the cartilage down here at the very end? Articular, and what type of cartilage was it? Hyaline cartilage. What do you call that fluid inside the joint? Synovial fluid, and that's inside the synovial cavity. Uh, we already talked about the articular capsule. Remember, you have two layers of that. You have the fibrous on the outside and the synovial membrane on the inside. Um, talked about this, synovial cavity, full synovial fluid, and then the ligaments. And the ligaments connect what to what? Bone, bone. bone to bone. Right. So when you look at these, they're actually supporting structures. When people have loose ligaments in their shoulder, what do they have a problem with? Think about it. If they're supporting structures and help hold the bones in place, that's when, is that when they start getting dislocated? That's when they start getting, yeah, they get dislocated shoulders easily. They start getting it where it pops out of place or shifts out of place. A subluxed or dislocated joint. Okay. And then other structures. So there are two special structures, the menisci and the bursa. And the menisci, when we look at the knee, they're actually little kind of like cartilaginous supports. I don't, I don't know a better word for it. They're hollow here in the middle, and they kind of shape around the outside to give support, almost like little cups sitting in there to guide the knee. Those are called menisci. Or yeah, a menisca. Huh? Yeah, I'm sure it doesn't. I've been, I've been lucky so far to never have torn or broken anything, so I'm trying to keep it that way. And then the bursa. The bursa are kind of cool. They remind me of when I was a kid and went to the doctor, because the doctor always had these sun-kissed jellies. Does anybody know what those are? Probably. Sun-kissed yeah. jellies. It's the sun-kissed, like the company that makes or sells oranges. And it's like a fruit snack, but it's round. You squeeze it and you can kind of roll it back and forth. I love those things and I can never find them anymore. But that's what this is like. 
It's like a little round disc, but it's jelly in the inside, and you can shift it back and forth. Where you find these burrs are usually underneath the ligaments or tendons, so that when the ligament or tendon gets pulled, they're not rubbing bone on the ligament. Because that bone's hard, if it rubs across, it creates a lot of friction and cause potential tears or damage. So these bursts that kind of roll, as you shift it, they roll underneath. Almost like if I put this marker, or I'll put this here. If I put this here, and as I pull one hand over the other, that burst just kind of rolls and reduces friction. And the bursa has its own little cavity inside that's full of a jelly-like material. So it's kind of like a little fluidy bag. All right. And then when you, when you talk about how the, the synovial joints work, the synovial joints have these different types. This is just synovial joints, not the amphiarthrosis or the synarthrosis. This is specifically synovial types. So when we talk about a plane joint, it's when two flat-ended bones glide across each other. So they can shift and glide. And you see that primarily in the wrist and the, in the foot. So as they're two short bones and they're shifting around, they can kind of glide over each other. It's called a plane joint. Hinge joints are just like the hinge on a door. How many directions does the hinge go? Just forward and backwards, that's it. There's no up, down, there's no diagonal, no nothing. Anywhere you see a hinge, you only get that one plane of movement, so two directions, forward and backwards. If you were to pin your elbow, even though you think, wow, I've got so much flexibility in my arm, if you pin your, your humerus to the wall so that your elbow had to stay flat, you can only move your elbow in and out. It doesn't go up and down at all, just back and forth. It's a hinge joint. So what's a plane joint? Plane joints where two short bones sit together and they have kind of a flat surface and they glide on each other. Like your wrist and your ankle? Yeah, so like when you shift like this, you can glide those across each other. Okay, and then elbow joints anywhere that you just have one plane. Like when you look at your fingers, if you hold on to the base of your finger, so the proximal phalange, hold on to it and try and bend your finger to the side. Try and bend this first joint between the phalanges to the side. Can't do it. You can only bend it forward and backwards. That would be a, another good example of a, a hinge joint. If you were looking at this name interphalangeal, what's that mean literally? Yep in between the phalanges. All right, next, pivots. So pivots, the perfect example were what were these two bones, the very first two bones in your neck? Axis and atlas. Which one was on top? Atlas, because it's holding that globe, that, that skull on your shoulders. And then that number one structure there is that bin that allows the pivot of the atlas on the axis. So you see how they fit right into each other and they allow to spin. The same thing up here, what bone is that? This is that ice cream scoop structure up here, so what bone are we looking at? Ice cream scoop, where did I tell you that? It's in the elbow. Which bone is the ice cream scoop? And I told you you'd have to remember that structure, the scoop. It's called the electronon process. Follow it up. Which bone does it connect to? It goes to the pinky side. What was that? Was that the radius or the ulna? Ulna. ulna. How do you know it's not the radius? Because the radius rotates, and that's why this is designed like that. It's a pivot joint. It spins up here at the elbow and allows you to pivot your hand, spin your hand. Right, and then condyles. Condyles always remind, remember, ugh, I can't speak. They remind me of, if you've ever seen people eat fancy eggs where they take the egg and soft boil it and they put it in a little cup, and then they tap the top off and break it off. That's what the condylar joints remind me of. You've got this little egg cup and you've got the egg that sits down in it. So where would you find a radiocarpal joint that's condyloid? The thumb side of the wrist? Yep, exactly. It's the thumb si side of the wrist. So this allows you to kind of move it around a little bit. I'm not pivoting it. I'm not spinning it and I'm not hinging it back and forth, and I'm also not gliding it, but I get a little bit of extra mobility because I have this egg-shaped structure so I don't wobble it around in there. How about a metocarpophalangeal? <coughs> Break it down. What's the first part of that word? Metacarpo. Metacarpo is in the... Where's the carpal? Carpal is the wrist, so the metacarpals must be the... That's across the palm of the hand. And then phalangeal means they're meeting up with... So if you look, this time just make a fist like this, can you spin your finger around? 
Yeah, when you talk about this going at the base of the flange, you can spin it around like that. But when you're just talking about the inner flangeal, you can only go in one direction. There's a difference. I love the next test because people are always moving during the test, trying to figure out what the heck joint it is. And then saddle joints, they call it a saddle joint because it looks like a little saddle for a horse and a rider sitting on top of it. And this is a special one. This you find in what's called the carpo metacarpal. What would that be? Carpo metacarpal. What do you think carpal is referring to? The wrist, metacarpal is referring to the palm. It's where the wrist and the palm connect. And here you can see it. And this joint, right here where the thumb comes together, it's kind of, you can move it kind of back and forth, but not as much to the side. It's when you start moving around like that, you get the tongue joint. And then the last one's ball and socket. And ball and socket's the most mobile. It's kind of like a condyloid, but deeper. So you get a lot more mobility. Something to keep in mind when you get into physiology and beyond is that the more mobile a joint is, what do you think the problem is? The what? The more likely it's to break or dislocate. The more mobile the joints are, the more likely you see people popping it out, dislocating it. It's like the sutures. You don't hear people breaking their sutures or popping them out of place. You hear about people dislocating shoulders and, and hips, and that's where you find the ball and socket, the deep sockets. Okay. Next is the knee, and I'm not going to spend a ton of time on the knee, but the knee is kind of like the ideal synovial joint to look as a model because it has lots of, well, it has all the parts. It has menisci in it, it has tendons, it has synovial joints, it has all different the parts. And there are actually three joints that meet up here, and I can't keep my finger on this, but. So the first one's the patellofemoral. What joint, or what's that joining? Yeah, the patella and the femur. So it's where the patella interacts or articulates with the femur. It helps guide the movement. Next is the medial lateral tibiofemoral. What's that? Tibiofemoral. Tibiofemoral. Tibia means the femur. So here you have medial and lateral. Which one's going to be the lateral? How do you know which is lateral in this picture? The side of the fibula. Right. Lateral is the side with the fibula on it. And then medial is the opposite. Right. When you look at the tendons, what's kind of interesting, I told you about this in the patella last week, but the patella doesn't actually connect bone to bone. The patella is suspended inside of a tendon. So you have this quadriceps tendon, which is how many muscles? Four, quad, right? So four coming together, they form into this one tendon that wraps over the knee. The patella sits in it to help guide the muscles and guide the knee. And then it connects to that special triangular thing at the top of the tibia, which is called the tibial, sorry, with a T. And I had you draw it in your notebook. Tibial tuberosity. And you can even see some of the other structures, like the meniscus down here. Remember, the menis meniscus is kind of like a disc to the hollow center that helps guide or support the outside structure. So it's wide here on the edge, and then it narrows down, and it tapers off and it gets deeper. What kind of cartilage is that where it's labeled cartilage? Hyaline. Yep, it's the articular cartilage. OK, and then the ligaments, you can see there are more than lots of ligaments in here, because you're supporting a lot of weight. You want support in every direction. When you look at some of these, by the way, the word re retinaculum means wrapper. You'll actually have a retinaculum. We won't talk about it. Uh, I don't think we do. Maybe we do talk about our muscles. You have a retinaculum across your wrist that helps hold all those tendons in place. You have a retinaculum here that helps support the, the structures inside the knee. And then some of the more top or more commonly referred to ligaments will be the anterior cruciate ligaments. What do they usually refer to that as? When you hear about people playing sports and they rip their ACL, anterior cruciate ligament. And if you have an anterior one, what else can you count on having? Anterior. <coughs> a posterior. That's an anterior and posterior. And then the collaterals. Look at the name, fibular collateral ligament. The collaterals will actually connect both of these on both sides. So you have a fibule and you have a tibial collateral. One on each. And then if we peel off the front and you look a bit deeper, there you can see the ACL. So the anterior cruciate ligament, you can see it starts back here on the back of the fibula or the femur, and it comes over, it crosses through the joint, and then connects to the front. This ACL is to prevent your leg from hyperextending, going way too far out. 
And a lot of times, this thing can have handle a lot of sport forward and backward, but when you take a side impact and twist it, it's not designed for that. What kind of connective tissue was that? Do you remember? Tendons and ligaments were both made of the same kind of connective tissue. Well, let's start. Was it loose or dense? It was dense. Was it dense irregular or dense regular? It's dense regular. All the fibers go in the same direction. So it can handle a lot of forward backward tension, but can it handle sideways? Nope. You push it too hard to the side, it starts tearing. And that's why people tear off their ACLs. Women actually have a, a bigger hip ratio. They call it the Q ratio, where the hips come out a little bit further. And so it puts more pressure on the knees and the ACL. So usually you hear about ACL injuries either in people that are really high in impact sports or women that are doing like soccer and basketball and things where they have to shift really quick. Not forward backwards running like sprints and marathons, but it's when they have to turn really quick. Because there's already a lot of pressure on the joint and the knee, and then when they shift really hard, it puts more on it and tears it. That's why if you start things like soccer and basketball and you haven't done it in a long time, you should slowly get into it before you get all completely all out. All right, so the ACL and the PCL. The ACL prevents hyperextension, and then the PCL does just the opposite. So it prevents you from overflexing or tearing too far back. Okay, and then a couple of diseases. So they're really... There are a lot of different forms of or arthritis, but there are real, really two major ones. There's osteo and there's rheumatoid. Osteoarthritis is when that hyaline cartilage wears down with time. So you've worn it down and you've roughened it up, and usually it's just from age. They don't know exactly what causes it or is a predictor of who's going to get it. There are a lot of theories that if you put a lot more pressure on your joints, like if you're an intense marathon runner, you do it all the time, it's going to put more impact on that cartilage. And the cartilage it has b very, very few blood vessels in it. So when you damage it, what happens? It's hard to repair. repair. And the more you damage it over and over and over again, the more it wears down. With osteoarthritis, that hyaline cartilage is almost completely worn off. And then you get these little things. Basically, they're like spurs. They're called osteophytes. They're little tiny fragments of bone that get in the joint. So every time you move, it's almost like having sand in your joint. It just rubs and makes it worse. When do these people feel the most pain? In the morning when they wake up after resting for eight hours or at the end of a hard day? <coughs> end of a hard day. It's the end of a hard day. They've been putting a lot of pressure on that joint and it's wearing everything down. They rest for eight hours, their body gets a chance to heal a little bit. And common places you see this are places that take a lot of impact, like knees and hips and fingers and stuff. The other one's rheumatoid. Rheumatoid is actually an autoimmune disease. Your body's attacking itself. They don't know the exact cause of this either. There are a lot of theories, but... So your body starts attacking your joints and causes swelling. And that swelling can actually bend the joints out of place. They call this ulnar deviation. Why would they call it ulnar devi deviation? What do they mean by ulnar? Yep, so it's shifting over towards the ulna. All that pressure and the fluid inside of there is shifting the joints out of place and they're actually deviating it over towards, towards the ulnar side. And panis, that word there, is just basically scar tissue that's accumulating in the joint. So they don't align up very well anymore. So it's hard to bend the joints. This is immune system attacking joints. When do they feel the pain here? When? All the time. Your immune system doesn't take a break. Hopefully your immune system doesn't take a break. So even when they get up in the morning, one of the signs that it's rheumatoid is if they have pain within for uh, an hour to two hours after waking up in the morning. Osteo, they feel fine in the morning most of the time. So here are some just cartoon versions. You can see the normal joint, you know, the fluid. Here you can see osteoarthritis where it erodes down the hyaline. And then here, the hyaline's in good shape, but look at all that swelling, the puffiness there in the joint. It's just like when you have some kind of infection on your arm, that area gets all puffy and red because your immune system's attacking it. Here, their immune system's attacking the joint. Another type, gouty arthritis, this is nasty. They used to call this the um, disease of king because if you had a high protein diet, as you're breaking down the proteins, as you get older, your kidney can't clear out all the protein breakdown products. So these products start building up in you, and they're called uric acids. So you get something called uremia, which means too much uric acid in your blood. Well, uric acid crystallizes when it gets cool. What time of day are, is your body going to be coolest? At night when you sleep. What parts of your body are going to be coolest? Your chest, your head, your feet. Where's going to be the coolest? The extremities, the hands and the feet. So at night while these people sleep, those those uric acids start forming crystals in their joints at their feet primarily, and then you know, their hands too. But what's really nasty, and I should get a picture of this, if you take and slice this joint open, 
there are little things called tophi that come out. There are little crystals that peel out of it, almost like uh, like laundry detergent soap, the dry version. They're just these little crystallized things that start pouring out. Out of the joint, yeah. So if they slice the joint open. And those crystals, every time they try and move the joint, the crystals are like sand inside the joint too. So it makes it really hard and painful. The first thing they do is they tell them to turn down their protein in their diet. Another thing they do is they'll give them a drug that helps them secrete the metabolites and it just gets worse with time. It never gets better. So drugs and diet are the only true. Huh? They don't typically cut it open. You don't want to if you can avoid cutting into a joint, don't cut into a joint. It's the same thing with your abdominal cavity. If, th if they can avoid cutting into the abdominal cavity, they try not to because scar tissue in a joint or the abdominal cavity is not good. Anywhere they make a decision is going to... The abdominal cavity because your, your GI tract is constantly moving over itself. If you look why, at... Why are they using a C-section for all those things? Like why are they starting? Because that's actually down below where your, where your intestinal cavity is at. It's a little bit lower. So they're not actually making the incisions into the like the small intestine, the large intestine. Because once they cut the small intestine, the large intestine, it's scars and it's not as mobile anymore. Um, on that point, endometriosis. Endometriosis is where uh, ovarian tissue goes up and gets in the abdominal cavity, and then it starts scarring all of that stuff together. So a lot of times that causes GI problems too, because it's it's like glue. That scar tissue is like glue. So if they can avoid making any kind of, I should have been more specific, any kind of GI surgery, they do. Okay, that was joints. That was pretty easy. 30 minutes.